And so the next speaker that we're going to have coming up here is Dr. Mike Van Elzeker. He's a research fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital and at the Harvard Medical uh, School. He's working in the Martino Center of Biomedical in uh, Imagery. And he wrote an influential paper on the role of the vagus nerve in ME-CFS. He's an expert in the brain, and that's a valuable uh, thing to know for this field of research. Uh, he's going to talk to you all today about the neurology in ME-CFS. Thank you very much, Mike. OK, hi, everybody. Um, it's not easy to follow Ron Davis and follow news that we don't get a break. <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, essentially, what I wanted to do is to talk a little bit about um, some studies that we have uh, ongoing uh, and just give you a little bit of an idea about why we're doing them and just a little bit of preliminary data. <clears throat> so this is a paper that we just wrote. Sorry, just go speak. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry. I'm trying to see what's up there. Um, this is a paper that we just wrote, uh, that we just published, that uh, um, just essentially talks about the, the study of neuroinflammation, uh, which is not an easy thing to study. And there's been some sort of false starts and essentially not very good evidence in this field thus far. Um, and w the article is kind of about why that is uh, and how we can, as a field, improve the methods. Um, so we have two ongoing studies. One is uh, that we just got approval for. It's a, st a study where we actually look for the closest thing we can do for uh, neuroinflammation, which is microglia activation. And the other is a study where we're looking at uh, what's the brain basis of post-exertional malaise. Um, so this is a paper that I wrote when I was a grad student. And uh, you know people still ask me about it, and I just want to make it uh, clear that this was, you know, it's never intended, just like Ron just said, you make hypotheses about mechanisms and then you chase them down. You know, I don't think that this is the answer for everybody, but I think it's important mechanisms that we could be thinking about, uh, and I still think it's an important mechanism. Um, so the, the term myalgic encephalomyelitis um, was originally coined in 1956 in The Lancet, um, and Essentially, uh, a doctor at the time ran through some of the outbreaks that had been happening, uh, Royal Free outbreak, uh, Akureyri in uh, Iceland, and noted that they all had sort of similar uh, presentation. Um, he, they, he discussed evidence, you know, this is very old technology, but they found evidence at the time of some uh, abnormal cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and they, he, this doctor called it benign myalgic encephalitis. The benign part was just to uh, denote that people weren't dying, not to say that the symptoms weren't severe. Um, but the fact, and you know, the fact is that uh, the encephalomyelitis des describes a, a, a specific mechanism, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then, of course, there was an outbreak, a uh, seeming outbreak in uh, Nevada in the um, 80s, and the term chronic fatigue syndrome was coined from that. Um, whether or not they're the same thing, we don't really know. Um, Microglia activation is the closest we can get um, as a proxy for the concept of neuroinflammation. Um, so microglia are an immune cell in the brain. Um, and what happens is when they detect um, essentially something going wrong, it could be a pathogen, it could be damage, even hypoxia, um, they activate, they, turn, they, they t sort of turn on, and this is what we're trying to detect. So the, the best evidence we have thus far, in my opinion, for neuroinflammation is this Nakatomi 2014 paper. Um, you know, still pretty small, um, but they had a good split between healthy controls and this condition. And it was sort of centered on brainstem, and uh, they found signal up into the, uh, the thalamus. So I wanted to talk a little bit about brainstem because I think it's really important. And this is the, this is the brainstem right here. Um, it's central to pain processing. It's central to neuroinflammation. And it's central to autonomic processing. 
Um, so if you actually run through the structures here, uh, right about here is what's called the nucleus of the solitary tract, which is where the vagus nerve enters the brainstem. Uh, the, dorsal uh, the dorsal motor vagus is right there, which is what controls heart rate. So for example, when people go from lying down to standing up, there's all kinds of adjustments that need to happen, and it's kind of centered right here. Um, so postural tachycardia is probably, uh, uh, you know, it's probably at the very least partially rooted in mechanisms here. Um, there's a, a structure here called area postrema, which is kind of a, a little breach in the blood-brain barrier where larger molecules can flow through, in, including immune molecules. So I want you to just sort of focus right about here um, where I've been talking about all these structures. Um, so this is from an Australian group named Barndon, where they found in patients versus controls an, an increase in signal, what's called a T1 signal, um, that it depends, you know, the different interpretations, but it may be the case that this represents, uh, you know, increased inflammation and increased um, cells entering the brain here, right where I was speaking. So it seems like this is an area that's really important. Um, this is from someone in our center named Vitaly Napado, and what he did was to show a standard, this is the techniques that everybody in neuroscience uses. Uh, what he did is to show how they align brains. So what you do is you take all the subjects from your experiment, and you have to line the brains up so you can meaningfully compare. And so he did that. In both cases, it lined up 10 people, and you can see how well the, the brain, the neocortex lines up, but how poorly the brainstem lines up, right? So this is what's showing the actual brainstem. So this is because most people in my field study the neocortex up here where thoughts and emotions and things like that happen. Down here is brainstem, which is boring things like uh, heart rate, arousal, fatigue, all the things that are wrong in these patients, right? Uh, sort of maybe a little bit more ancient um, uh, processes that the brain's responsible for. So a lot of important information about brainstem has probably been missed. So just as a little bit of a review, the vagus nerve goes in two directions, and here's where it connects in the brainstem. Um, it's really important for the detection of things that are happening in the body. So for example, when you have an adrenaline rush, adrenaline doesn't actually easily cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, in fact, it's detected by the vagus nerve, which causes sort of an adrenaline response on the brain side. And we see this pattern over and over again, where the vagus nerve is really important for detecting what's happening in the periphery. And that includes immune molecules. So for example, if you have a small infection in your stomach, the, the reason you feel sick is because the vagus nerve has detected uh, immune molecules that are being produced right there on the site. And it can do so because it's uh, so highly branched. Vagus shares the same Latin root as the word vagabond. It means to wander. Um, and when it detects the, uh, something in the periphery, it's, it initiates what's called the sickness response. And this is the, the reason that you feel bad in the same way, whether you have the flu or strep, right? Um, you feel tired, you feel worn out, you can't recover well, you feel sore, you have a headache, etc. Right? And then I wouldn't argue that this condition is the sickness response, but I think it's really a key part of what a lot of people experience, and I think we shouldn't ignore that. So one of the things that happens is when vagus detects something in the periphery, it triggers on the brain side of the blood-brain barrier an inflammatory process, and that's what we're trying to measure. So Nakatomi found that inflammatory process here. Um, they used an older radio, what's called a radio ligand. That's the thing that you inject um, to look for a signal of inflammation called PK11195. And so I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about what that actually is. So the, the, the macrophages of the brain are called microglia. So macrophage, big eater, those are the things that eat up particles and pathogens. They're part of your immune system. And these are in your brain. When they detect either cytokines or pathogens or sort of anything uh, having to do with damage, they activate. So they actually change shape and all these little arms kind of retract, and they, the, the cells themselves become thicker, uh, and this is called a state of activation. When that happens, they produce a whole bunch of stuff. 
Uh, and that includes things that excite neurons, that includes more cytokines, and that includes a protein called the translocator protein. The translocator protein is what we look for in these PET scans to see if there's neuroinflammation. And importantly, the neuroexcitation modulator, so glutamate, bradykine, and prostaglandin is ATP, a whole bunch of stuff that excites neurons. Part of what that does is to make it really hard to concentrate. Uh, that's the reason that, for example, when someone's had a concussion, they can't think straight. It's the reason when someone's had a, a concussion, they're really sensitive to light and sound, right? Um, these cells act as amplifiers of, nor of normal nerve signals. And so we think that if neuroinflammation, as measured by microglia activation, is happening in this condition, then that may explain some of the cognitive symptoms. And importantly, for this sort of sepsis model, um, these cells can enter a state called primed, which, which means that if they've previously encountered some really bad, um, whatever, infection or injury, they actually become kind of sensitized, a, a, a little bit hypervigilant, if you will. Um, and we, we can't actually measure this yet. We don't know how to do that. But it's a functional thing where if, we, if you deliver the exact same amount of stimulation to a primed microglia, you get a huge response even bigger than the previous one. Uh, and so this might explain, for example, um, why people in, the, in this condition uh, have an extra big response to small stimuli. So for example, if your microglia were primed, that could explain why you know, you're really sensitive to chemicals, why uh, relatively small subsequent infections can cause a really bad crash, um, why any provocation can cause sort of an ongoing lengthy crash. So that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out. Unfortunately, though, um, microglia are activated in a, I lost it. Microgli microglia are activated in a lot of conditions. So I've got a list here uh, that includes Huntington's. Can you hear me? OK, great. Um, I've got a list here that includes Huntington's, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, bipolar, schizophrenia, uh, brain injury, um, suicidality, depression. So unfortunately, just saying that we found this signal doesn't really help us all that much because it's kind of in everything that goes wrong with the brain. So when patients say they have neuroinflammation based on this one study, I mean, yes, it's kind of technically true, but the problem is it's in a lot of things. So we need to get a little bit more specific, and that's one of the things that we're working on. So in the other direction, the vagus nerve controls uh, autonomic responses. I've talked a little bit more uh, about that before. So the, the idea of changing heart rate when you stand up and things like that. Um, and this, can, this is the reason that uh, these patients fail the tilt table test, why they have postural tachycardia. Um, and it's measurable with what we call an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test, which our colleague at uh, Brigham and Women's, David Sistrom, does. Um, and essentially what we do is to take advantage of the fact that getting this exercise test is, of course, going to cause a crash in patients. So in this study, we get uh, patients from Donna Felsenstein, um, and, and Louisa Oaklander does her uh, small fiber neuropathy testing. Uh, David Sistrom does the IC PET, and of course it causes a crash. Um, and this is essentially the design uh, where they have an, a radial arterial line and a pulmonary arterial line. So essentially, he can measure fully deoxygenated blood as it's entering the lungs and fully oxygenated uh, blood as it's exiting the lungs. So we can tell, for example, if these patients are using oxygen inefficiently, are they not using as much oxygen as they should be using during a, a, a difficult exercise test? And what we do is we scan people before at baseline symptoms, your sort of regular symptoms, uh, and then they undergo this test, and we say, 
What, when do you expect to feel worse, 24 hours later, 48 hours later, or 72 hours later? And we bring people back during this crash. And patients are extraordinarily generous um, to let us do this because we know how uncomfortable it is. They're in the scanner for a really long time. We do all kinds of autonomic testing. But we're getting a truly massive amount of information from this testing that we think is going to be really valuable. Um, so this is just sort of a, a little bit of a design of what we're doing. Um, and this is our colleague, Phoebe Chan, who's doing a, um, she's actually taking a Doppler ultrasound of uh, Ceci's, our, a graduate student, uh, her middle cerebral artery. So what we were trying to do is to figure out, can we predict the blood flow actually in the brain from stuff that's happening in the periphery? Uh, and this is when we were sort of working it out in the pilot phase. And so what we do is we collect a huge amount of information while they're actually in the scanner. So we're measuring the amount of gas that's exhaled, how much CO2, how much O2. Uh, and just to show some preliminary data before I get to the, the, um, the blood stuff, one of the things that we found is what we call enlarged perivascular spaces or vercorobin spaces. So these are kind of little um, areas where it's, it's almost like a little opening uh, where the veins flow through. It's kind of like a, uh, a proxy marker for inflammation. Now, we can't look at this and go, oh, there it is. There's the MECFS. But we can look at it and say, boy, that's a 30-year-old woman, and her brain shouldn't look like that. Um, so it's one of the things that sort of adds up to give us information that the brain's not healthy. And we see them in all three areas where they tend to, to be found in some patients. Uh, and we sort of see them over and over again. And so here's some preliminary data showing uh, perfusion. And, and just to be clear, People have shown this before, so a failure of perfusion uh, in general uh, is associated with post-exertion malaise. What we're doing is we're showing it with greater detail than people 20 years ago literally could have dreamt of. Um, and what we're seeing again is this is baseline symptoms, so they're sick here, um, and here's extra sick during PM. And what we see here in sort of the temporal pole is really blood flow is not getting there. Now, what this means, where it comes from, it's probably a bunch of things, but one thing could possibly be the actual movement of red blood cells um, or the actual pumping of blood. Uh, and we saw that with two pilot patients. We're continuing to do preliminary analysis, uh, and we're continuing to, to recruit and, and, uh, and continue with this study. Um, and I just wanted to show really quickly another set of preliminary data where we do magnetic resonance spectroscopy before and after. And what we've seen is very preliminary, but what we've seen is a reduction in glutamate and a reduction in a combined glutamate-glutamine. Now, to, to my mind, this is interesting because at least at this preliminary stage, it doesn't look like increased inflammation with PEM acutely. What it looks like is decreased perfusion, and then from that, perhaps, because hypoxia, hypoxia itself is inflammatory, so it may be the case that the neuroinflammation follows the lack of perfusion. We're collecting a whole lot more information, and I just want to thank everybody uh, who helped us with this. Thanks very much.